and still a huge uh, mental health crisis for us. Um, I spent my first 27 years, the last 27 years being the medical director of a program in Long Beach called The Village, which worked with people who are homeless in and out of their jails and out of psychiatric hospitals, who also have severe mental illnesses, often psychosis, substance abuse, childhood trauma, all kinds of things like this. And we developed, along with other people around the country and the world, a recovery movement that said, let's work not so much on fixing what's wrong with them or forcing them to take meds or treatments or coercing them, but let's work on helping them find the strengths in themselves in order to connect to other people, to rebuild their lives, to find meaning, and to ultimately reconnect to our communities to have uh, meaningful roles in life. And what we discovered as we were going through developing recovery programs like this is that hope is the first step to recovery. If someone comes to you with a terrible story that they've had to go through in their lives, terrible child abuse and trauma and drug abuse and destroying things and homelessness and prison and being attacked and raped and all kinds of things. And if you go, well, don't, it's not that bad. Things will be okay. I'm glad you came to see us. We're gonna be able to help you life. Things will work out. Things will be fine. That may be optimism or reassurance, but that is not hope. Hope begins with saying, wait a minute, let me hear how things really are, how terrible things really are for you, not closing my eyes to them or pretending that they're not there. And let's see if with eyes open, we can find some kind of way to make a plan to move from here. If you remember Pandora's box, she didn't get to be hopeful by putting all the things in the box and crunching them down in and pushing them aside and trying never to think of them again. She opened the box and faced all the terrible feelings that were inside and hope was glowing at the bottom of this box. Currently, in schools and mental health, we're in a really serious problem, in serious situations. One is we have ongoing student mental health crises that appears to be growing and growing and growing. The second one is the corona pandemic itself has a substantial negative effect on mental health. It appears that this is much harder to handle mentally for most of us than we would have guessed. The third one is that schools are in a very crucial position for both medical and economic spread. I mean, if we think about the risk of us all getting sick going back to school or kids coming from school and spreading it to their families and around, it's really, really high. If you think of it, virtually nobody ends up getting viruses or sick going to a basketball game or a concert, whereas we all get sick and viruses from our kids going to school or from going to school ourselves around every single year. The odds are this is a very high medical risk when we reopen in the fall. On the other hand, it's crucial for the economy. Our whole economy is set up, our whole family structures is set up, our whole social structure is set up that has children spending large amounts of time in schools during the day both so their parents can work for extended families, for all kinds of other factors. And without that service, um, our world doesn't really work very well. So we're being forced because we have to really reopen schools to reopen what's probably the most medically dangerous spot for all of us. On top of that, we could use extra money to do all these things. Maybe it'd be nice to have testing and cleaning things and spaces in schools and extra stuff for distance learning and all kinds of things. But in fact, we're gonna have budget cuts, not budget adds to things. We're gonna to have to be doing things with a budget that's gonna go down like it did in the recession. And then also, for those of you who do any school administration, schools are impressively elaborately regulated. They get stuff from the feds, from the state, from the county, from uh, boards of education, from administrators, from, student, from uh, unions, from parents, from all kinds of things, from edu um, all kinds of regulations. So this is a sort of situation in which to make big changes, you can't just have someone have decisive leadership and good ideas and push forwards. It has to be done in an incredibly elaborate uh, space that schools exist in. Now, I'm not gonna talk about any of those last three things hardly at all, 
There's people who know a lot more about the movement, but to recognize those are part of what we're working with for the struggle. I'm going to focus on the first two. The, the, today's primarily on the first one and setting up a premise for the next one, and then the next two heavily on what happens in the pandemic to mental health uh, feelings. Oh, and by the way, we're also supposed to be learning and teaching in schools at the same time as we're doing all the rest of these. So if we can accept where we at with all these problems, what kind of things can we look at to get better? So I came from the village three years ago to be the student psychiatrist at Cal State Long Beach. I work there part-time. I'm the only psychiatrist there for 38,000 students. Um, I'd been interested in college psychiatry for most of my life and when I first got out of residency. And then again, when my kids went to college 10 or 15 years ago, but there hardly was jobs for psychiatrists and students in colleges. It didn't exist hardly. There's a little college counseling center for if you have problems like with homesicknesses or roommates or breakups or something like this. But at least when I watch my kids go to school and listen to their presentations at parent days and orientations, they would have been way out of their league trying to talk to people with really severe mental illnesses or hospitalizing people or suicide attempts or psychosis. There's also some student health centers, but that's primarily for reproductive health and sexual conditions and infections and injuries, stuff like this. Nowhere is it intended to have large scale community mental health for people with serious mental problems within a college campus. And yet we're seeing that grow dramatically um, on campuses all over the country. So when I showed up, the first thing I saw was this opinion that you see here in the Psychology Today quote, it's neither an exaggeration nor is an alarmist claim there's a mental health crisis facing America's college students. Now, Psychology Today is not any great academic or uh, research journal, but it is a place to see where the public is getting its narrative, what's being told to people, what people are reading in the newspapers and things, and that's what we believe that there is a crisis in mental health today. The graph there next to that comes from the Center for Collegiate Mental Health doing uh, surveys and uh, analyzed by the American Psychological Association. So this is the people who work as professionals. And notice something about these graphs, these bars. They're absurdly high. They're going up, but they're also absurdly high. Look at the third one there. It says we're at 10% a few years ago, of people in college or students were hospitalized for mental health. So that means that there's 38,000 students at Cal State Long Beach. They've had 3,800 psychiatric hospitalizations. And look at the far line about suicide attempts. That's also at about 10%. Does that mean that there have been 3,800 suicide attempts and the students are in the college that I'm at? If so, that's an overwhelming amount of distress at a very severe levels. Now, when you see something like that, you can either say, well, that must be like a mistake or we try to explain things away because it's unbelievable. Or you have to change your beliefs and say, wait, wait, how do I change my beliefs to fit what's actually going on? So let's look around for some more information. How about for kids? Here's one about using outpatient services. We've got kids different ages, boys and girls, and they're all going up dramatically. We've got from the child psychiatrist, these aren't just how many people feel anxious or how many people have ever used pot. These are saying that 30% have an anxiety disorder or a substance abuse disorder. And we start seeing these things across everything. Look at this set, for example. Here's depression from the education literature. Look at the young people one. It's going up and up and up dramatically while people my age is staying fairly stable. The one on the top right is about bipolar disorder. Look at how that line for the youth is going up and up and up. The bottom one is something we worry about a fair bit is ADHD. And it's going up too, though seemingly not as dramatic as everything else. Does this mean that we've got multiple epidemics in, in every single kind of mental illness possibly going on all at once, all for young people right now. This seems to be almost unreal or unbelievable. How could that possibly be true? And you can, any given one of these graphs, 
you can criticize the data and the data collection, how it was done, and wonder, well, is that really right? But they all go the same way. Look at this one from the surveys of college mental health students. Every single disorder here, except for schizophrenia at the very beginning, appears to be going up and up and up of everything. So I want to go back a second to a thing I said here, it said, are we facing an escalating mental health collapse like the climate change collapse? Maybe looking at all these disorders separately, saying, is are we having a crisis in depression, a crisis in anxiety, a crisis in ADHD, a crisis in autism, a crisis in substance abuse, a crisis in anxiety disorders, a crisis in eating disorders and everything? Or do these things fit together in some way? Remember how you may, guys may or not remember when climate change used to be global warming. Just this one thing, the temperature going up. And then we realized this was part of an incredibly elaborate interactive thing of our overall climate with sea waters and, and acidity and water tables and storms and ice melting and, and uh, animals moving, people moving, all kinds of things interacting. And in the same way, maybe we've got all kinds of things interacting in a mental health way. It isn't just one thing. And we see people with ideas for one thing behind this. All right, the big problem is you all spend way too much time on your cell phones and that's ruining your development. Or the big problem is all us parents are helicopter parents and we don't let you do anything to get into trouble or learn anything on your own. We overschedule all your time and that ruins things. Or we don't have churches anymore, or we pressure you to take too many AP classes, or, or we come with a whole bunch of individual ideas. And individual ideas are easy to come up with solutions and plans. Like going back to climate for a moment, when they said the ozone layer was getting weakened because of hydrofluorocarbons, we got rid of the cans that were putting that out, we fixed that. That's way different than climate change, a whole bunch of things interacting. And I'm saying maybe a whole bunch of different things are interacting in mental health. It doesn't make sense that you'd have 12 different epidemics all happening at once. So what can we look at to even begin to understand what's going on um, with young people? And what we've been doing so far is promoting illness-centered models. You guys may well have seen these two models, these two programs, they are very widespread, very popular. They are both based on the idea that there's a bunch of illnesses out there that are getting worse. They say what really people need to do is identify what the early signs are of mental illnesses, help decrease the stigma so that people are okay getting help, make sure they get to professionals and get to help, and then we'll treat them and make them better. Mental Health First Aid is a general pro education program across our communities. QPR is specifically about suicide, saying that if we treat more mental illnesses, then we won't have as many suicide attempts. This is saying, let's look at this from an illness lens. There's a few big problems with our medical model illness point of view. One is, everyone kind of has to believe in it for it to work. When someone comes and says, I'm all suicidal, and you say, you know, that's a symptom of depression, let's get you to a treatment, see if you can use some meds or therapy to get better. They have to believe that they have some kind of illness underneath things. And that's different than if they said, no, my problem really is that my dad is sexually molesting me, or my problem is that I'm a victim of racism, or my problem is that my family is homeless. Many people don't necessarily see things as illnesses, and it's not even a common sense for, for everything. So it takes a fair bit of education and pressure to get people to look at things in this mental illness way. This approach says that everybody out there, other students, peers, teachers, primary care doctors, administrators, everybody is a first contact who needs to be educated in what mental illnesses are to refer you to the right professionals. We also need to reduce stigma so people won't feel bad about reporting in for mental illness. They won't feel ashamed of this. And we need a massively increased mental health workforce. For example, they believe colleges need about one counselor for every 1,000 students and one psychiatrist for every 10,000 students. 
you may remember that saying that I'm a part-time psychiatrist for 38,000 students. There are not funds or personnel available for anything like those numbers. It's been sent up to Sacramento repeatedly to ask for funding for this and repeatedly rejected. And there's no way that's going to happen, which leaves us in this weird position that we've got encouraging everybody to refer everybody, refer everybody, refer everybody to places that have waiting lists and barely exist and or don't have the resources to handle what's already coming. And remember, all this is before the pandemic. Also, this model is heavily professionally directed. You come for treatment to someone like me, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist of some kind, very limited role for helping yourself, for helping other peers, um, or for the community to act as a whole. Those are the weaknesses to the illness-centered model. So my point overall in this introduction is that we appear to have a huge increase in mental health problems across the board. Understanding this as a set of illnesses all with simultaneous epidemics doesn't make much sense. And the medical approach is leading us down into a dead end of saying refer, refer more people to us when we can't handle the ones we've got. If we look at like climate change instead, what's going on with our mental health climate, what choices do we have instead? Uh-oh, my uh, slide got stuck for some reason. Hold on a second, guys. Why did that happen? All right, I got it. Maybe I have it fixed. So I'm offering instead a developmental way of looking at things that says we're not all loaded with lots and lots of underlying neurochemical imbalances that have gotten uh, triggered and need to be rebalances. Our illnesses aren't the cause of all this distress. They're the result of all this distress. And it's not a question of nature versus nurture that psychologists love talking about forever. It's how our nurture impacts our nature. In my point of view, we're born with different traits, different tendencies, even the blueprint for a life force that pushes us to learn and grow and develop over time. And then life happens. Sometimes life does really good things that give us opportunities to move forwards and encouragement. Sometimes life is, gives us really bad things and obstacles and gets stuck and distorted. The feelings that we get when we get stuck, things like I got no more energy, I can't get out of bed, I'm depressed, I'm terribly anxious, I got negative thoughts, feeling going round and round in circles, I have to use pot every day just to cope with things that go by, I can't pay attention anymore. These ways of getting stuck are what we're calling the illnesses. And the, in my point of view, the goal of treatment, including medications, is not to treat underlying chemical imbalances. It's to get unstuck so you can learn and grow and develop again. And that suffering in general isn't meant to be diagnosed and eliminated as some distasteful, strange experience. Suffering is meant to be learned from, and hopefully we develop strengths from our struggles. So if we look at it that way, we have to have a good, solid model of what our development is like. Stuck again. Um, actually, I'm going to skip this one. I'm running a little behind. So, in the middle of a pandemic, I'm sorry, I should sidetrack myself. In the middle of a pandemic, should we even be focusing on mental health things and development things? We've got all these terrible problems. I saw on this first slide, we've got problems with just having enough money and food in many families got things. And many of you can see, remember something called Maslow's hierarchy that says, first work at the basic stuff, money and food and safety, and then eventually we'll worry about mental health things on the top. I was watching a couple of weeks ago, Chris Christie on one of those morning Sunday political shows. And he was talking about this woman who came to a food uh, distribution area. And our schools are some of the biggest food distribution in our whole system. And she was feeling humiliated being there. She said it was the first time she'd ever been at a, had needed food or charity in any way. She felt like a failure. How could my life have come to this? How come I can't take care of myself? I'm just a failure here. And Chris Christie said, you know, this is how serious mental illness gets going. This is how she can end up using drugs. This is how you can end up with domestic violence out of frustration. This is how you can end up with suicide. 
And I think Chris is right because her, she's how we experience things is not necessarily on the same level of what our crisis is. So we experience, this lady isn't experiencing not having enough food as a problem of basic food and shelter. She's experiencing it as a psychological issue, that she's a failure as a mental issue. And many of us are experiencing what's going on through mental things. We're experiencing this is a change in how I view myself, this is a change in my relationships, this is a change in how I'm getting along with other people, this is a change in me feeling more depressed and anxious. So that even though you could argue we should be spending time focusing on basic food, shelter, illness things, practical things, jobs, money. Many of us are experiencing this as an emotional and mental crisis, and so we need to focus on the mental level, even though those other things are going on at the same time. So when we look at how things affect us mentally, it depends where we are in our development. And there's, there's a lot of different schemas for this. I'll give you a relatively simplified one here that has four stages. One stage is that we have other people meet our basic needs. We cry or complain or ask for things and somebody else, usually parents, but somebody else provides to make sure we have food, housing, a place to stay, a secure life, some protection from violence. The next level is if we're going as a child, we say we focus on we're strengthening ourselves. We say mine about things, we say no about things, we want to do it ourselves. We start developing our own clothes, our own styles, our own music, our own likes, our own idea of what are my strengths, what's good about me, what's weak about me, a sense that I can manage in the world, a sense of self-efficacy, I can handle things. The next level is we start paying attention to other people around us and realizing they all have their own feelings and their own likes and dislikes too. Oftentimes love is the entrance to this level in a big way. You start caring deeply about how someone else is and you can lower your own walls that have been protecting your own identity in order to be able to connect with other people. The goal here is connectedness. And there's a fourth level beyond that where people focus on how they fit in the much larger world, how they fit in the sp spiritual world. Oftentimes God and religion is an entrance to this level. Nature can often be a level as well. And for lack of a better word here, I'm going to, this is finding how what you're meaning in the larger scheme of things. Now, each of these levels has risk to them. For instance, if you're at the level of basic needs, hunger and homelessness, failure to supply block of security, you could argue, by the way, that our current racial stuff about police attacking you and can kill you at any time is a basic needs. Is my security okay? when the basic people are supposed to maintain security in our community can attack and kill me at any time. Forming a personal identity can be hard to create and sustain your sense of identity and purpose. You can have a hard time feeling like you're accomplishing things, teasing and bullying can come in here. You can start feeling like failure, try to do more and more, and you feel like you're a fraud, you're just accomplishing things, but really inside you're not worth much. It, empathy and personal relations can be hard. Love is very hard. Relationship breakdowns are a, a huge stress. You end up feeling all lonely and isolated. Try to compensate with social media and connectedness, leaving yourself feeling both inadequate on a personal identity level, but also disconnected. And then connecting to a larger spiritual reality, there's less and less power of uh, churches and religion in our lives, become disconnected from rituals. We're not even connected to nature very much or the rhythm of life. And we can think that there's no meaning left to anything we're doing. And each of these levels has strategies to help you strengthen, depending on where you're at. And the reason I'm telling you all this stuff is because when you were helping yourself, helping others and your family, students and stuff, it's worth saying, what level is this person at? What's the most important? So for instance, let's go back to Chris Christie's lady with the food. If we would have said her real problem is that she's on level one, she's hungry, she's starving, she's afraid, she's going to die of starvation, then giving her food is in fact the correct intervention. But she wasn't at that level. She was at the next level saying, I'm a failure. I'm no good. For her, just giving her food, she still feels like a failure. For her, a better intervention would have been to say, you know what? We need some volunteers here at this food 
station, handing out food to someone else. If you come and volunteer for an hour and help us put together these things, you can take home some food for your own family. If we'd have done that, she would have felt good about herself. She's doing things she's contributing and also have the food she needs. If she in addition is on the next level feeling all isolated, she's disconnected, you say, you know what? We got a bunch of people here coming by for food. They're disconnected, and especially the elder that we're worried about, but not entirely. Can you put together a little phone tree so you call each other to be able to connect to each other so that you've got someone to call to connect with? And yes, while you're doing that, you can remind them when the food comes and hands out food, and you can have some for doing this. Then we're helping her connection level. And if she's at the fourth level, we're talking about meaning. She might say, you know, I don't know what God, why God did this to me, why we have this virus amongst us, why all these bad things happened to me, why this is falling apart. Something like, you know, sometimes God tries to teach us lessons out of suffering, looking for meanings out of sufferings. You know, you're now, you used to really look down on homeless people in food kitchens and these things. Now you feel more compassion for them. And you, st you may be able to connect to things. And this you might come out of this a much more compassionate person than you went into it as a result, helping her find meaning from her suffering. Notice how the same project, the food distribution, can be used to help in each of these ways. If you're a teacher trying to help people, you can say, well, we're doing the homework assignment, but what's their problem here? Are they struggling terribly because their needs have fallen apart, their family's falling apart? because they don't have a sense of their own identity, because they're disconnected from other students and their friends, because it's, everything seems meaningless, there's no even point to going to school anymore. And you can design how you're doing your everyday work so that it meets people at the level that they're at. So when this pandemic first started and I was stuck at home for a while, I started noticing how really hard this seemed to be. And I started wondering about Anne Frank, and I bring up Anne Frank because I think almost all of us have read this diary. I read it, of course, many, many years ago. And I was like, well, how did she make in that attic? I've even been to this attic in Amsterdam. It's a museum now, but it's a fairly small place. And I decided, let's reread this book. And the first thing that struck me was she was in that attic for over two years. I'm here struggling at two months into this. How did she do this? So I reread the book and I noticed a few things that I hadn't noticed when I was younger, the first round. One is she, her father was a millionaire before the Nazis came in, they had to leave Germany. That's why they've got all these people looking after them. That's why there's this business downstairs. That's why they can have these ration tickets for everything. They can buy these people to help take care of them. So that Anne has no basic problems at level one. She doesn't worry about that she can starve, even when the food is terrible, because she didn't come from a childhood of deprivation. And notice, whether you come from a childhood of serious deprivation, your basic needs or not, can make a big difference on how you look at people and how you connect with them. So for those of you out there who are teachers and parents and other helpers, mental health professionals, whatever, who have had lived experience of severe deprivation and not insecurity at level one, you're very much needed to connect to and relate to the students who are at that level going through things because it doesn't relate nearly as well to people who haven't. All right, well, going back to Anne Frank. So Anne Frank, she's going to this school before this happens, and she's a flirt, and she collects up how many boys that have fallen in love with her because they carry her books home, and she uh, keeps track of what the movie stars are doing in the royalty. I mean, it seems to me, that she's 13, this seems to me, give her some social media, and she would have been right at home, and you can sort of visualize this sort of thing. The first year she's stuck in that attic, and she's there with her parents, her sister, another family with a my older son and a single dentist who she shares a room with. And the first year she's terribly depressed and anxious and upset, not so much because out of hunger or fear of the Nazis, because she feels stuck. There's nobody to talk to. Her mom doesn't understand her. Everyone picks on her. They call her a chatterbox and want her to shut up. You're, why don't you be quiet and nice like your sister is? 
everyone feels like bullying and she goes end up in a room crying to herself into her diary over and over and over again because she's stuck like this. She's gotten, she's starting to develop mental symptoms because her development is stuck. She's not developing as a person and she's not developing connections. Both level two and three are in trouble. In her second year, she does somewhat better. For one thing, she starts exploring intimacy with Peter, the, the uh, boy who's a few years older than her who lives there. Now, Peter is, to be fair, is kind of a dud. It's not someone she'd have normally been interested in. He doesn't know what he's doing. In today's world, I think he'd be sitting all days playing video games. She even has to imagine some young Peter she knew is a different guy that she had a crush on to be able to get any sort of excitement doing. And she works with him to try to get it so he'll sit with the moonlight with her holding hands. So at least she can start experiencing some feelings of opening herself up and feeling what it feels like to fall in love or enjoy her first kiss or even holding hands and things like this. She also starts confiding with her sister a little bit and the feelings she's having. So she's starting to make some connections with the only peer she's got there, Peter and her sister. The other thing that happens at the same time the Dutch government, which was in exile because the Nazis had taken over Holland, said they wanted people to, for after the war to collect up writing of things that happened for what life was like under the Nazis during the war. And Anne started visualizing maybe she could make a book out of this diary after the war. She was thinking of maybe something called like Secrets from the Attic or something like this. And she, make a book. she starts seeing herself as an author, seeing herself being able to do something and contribute. So by the end of the second year, she's doing much better because she's got an identity going and she's got connections going. So when you're thinking of yourself, of your friends, of your students, people around who are struggling, are there ways that you can increase the amount of connectedness and amount of your identity coming out of this so that um, it's not as hard, it's not as devastating mentally? Now, we don't have a diary of Anne Frank's parents. Well, I wonder what her father or mother was like, or let alone Anne Frank's school teachers. What levels were they all on? What kind of supports would they have had? I have read one other very different book. It happens to be written by a psychologist who is on level four. His name is Victor Frankel. His book is Man's Search for Meaning about his time in Auschwitz. He, since he's also trained in mental health, he notices these same levels. And he talks about how the Nazis are intentionally destroying these levels. They don't give, at level one, they don't intentionally don't give you enough food and you have to work really hard and you're getting infections and you're getting dirty and you can't take care of yourself and you're slowly losing all sense of security in life. At the next level, your identity, they take away all your belongings, all your clothes, everything make you individual, a stamp, a number on your arm. Um, you are just a cog in this giant death machine. You don't mean anything as an individual, take it all away. The relationships, they separate families from each other. They separate you from your friends, keep moving people around. They get people to betray each other in order to decrease the amount of trust and relationships going on. And they do all this by threatening to kill you all the time, which they do do all the time. And Victor Franco says, you know what? I don't know that I'm going to be able to avoid death. He thinks, you know, I have a huge chance of dying here, 80, 90% chance of dying at least. So I can't avoid, do things to avoid death. All I can do is act together with how my soul and my heart does their sort of meaning. So at least I am acting in a way that's meaningful to me, even if they're killing me. I can't keep myself alive, but I can keep myself going in meaning. He survives by looking at the meaning of each action he does and how God will look down on him as soul. He's a level four person. I bring him up because there are people at this level, not very many of us, clearly, um, but meaning can make a big difference to people. Think for yourself, what kind of ex inspiring examples do you have in your family or culture and what kind of levels are they on? I wanna bring up a more down to earth inspiring example and perhaps, actually I wish he was here today to give advice about the riots. Dr. Carl Bell died last year. For those of you who don't know who this is, he's a child psychiatrist, is a, was a very bright young black man, raised in Chicago, his parents were educated, and he went to medical school very young, and he came out to be a child psychiatrist. He was running a huge program for 
um, children in the south side of Chicago and the projects who were taken away in foster care and were abused and subject to all kinds of violence. He also was very big on trying to avoid um, black on black violence. He was filled with outrage. He was a very outspoken man. He was friends with people like Oprah and Obama. And his, I ran into him for a couple of years, a few years back, and he, I was impressed by something he said, risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. And he showed two uh, graphs. I can't find his original graph, so I drew the lines there so you could see what they look like. One says, if you take kids and have all kinds of bad things happen to them, all kinds of worse mental symptoms will result. Once again, it's not an epidemic of a bunch of different illnesses. It's they've been clobbered with all kinds of events. That's the blue line. It goes up as things bad things happen. But what happens, he says, that's when you don't have protective factors. If you have protective factors, that's the orange line. It almost doesn't matter how many bad things happen. You won't get much worse mentally. I, what, what, how is that supposed to work? Look at his protective factors money to make it through the month and a little extra for emergencies, a reasonably secure place to live, family support, doesn't have to be good family, some other caring involved adults, he calls them adult protective shield, this is like neighbors, teachers, coaches, ministers. A ki the kid has to believe there's something else in their life besides being a bad kid or mentally ill. They're, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be an athlete, I'm going to be somebody. And some sense of spiritual connection. Notice how his protective factors cover the four developmental levels. He's got things going that says, if you are helping people to have a secure development, then they don't end up with these symptoms of mental illness to overwhelming them. A similar slide, and this one is entirely stolen. You can tell by the fancy uh, uh, way it moves around that I, yeah, that I haven't done any of like this. This is from the National Child Trauma Stress Network which I suggest looking at is a good place to find things about child trauma. And this is like slide 75 on a presentation about child trauma. And I put it up there just for you to notice, look at these items again. These are once again, ways of supporting the same developmental stages. Notice, however, that unlike Dr. Bell, they don't have level one in there. Maybe they didn't grow up in as deprived of way as he did. But level two certainly is there about self-esteem and self-efficacy and confidentness. And level three with school connectedness, pill support and family support and spiritual beliefs. Notice how these same sets of things that help you develop come in in terms of whether you're talking about trauma, if you're talking about protective factors, if you're development. This is the way to handle the mental health climate, not by referring over to mental illnesses. Certainly if things break down, we're there to help. But this is about what do people need to stay well so they don't end up in these terrible crises? So I've gone through a whole bunch of stuff about how bad things are and a point of developmental point of view and a point about how you can help people at these different levels. So if we think how to put together a plan right now, instead of thinking this is the pandemic is triggering a whole bunch of epidemics at the same time, it's a complex event that's disrupting people's personal development. It's undermining their psychological balance. It's traumatizing many people. If we intervene in developmentally develop appropriate ways, and all of us can do this interventions, including by increasing security, self-efficacy, connectedness, and meaning, we can protect ourselves and each other and build resilience. And now using the language of the public health service, there will still be some people who overcome, even we try to help them develop many and need professional care, but we can quote, bend the curve with a public mental health approach, caring for each other to avoid overwhelming our limited mental health system and to help people make it through this and continue to develop and grow so they don't get stuck and they don't start developing mental symptoms. All right, that's the end of my formal presentation. I think maybe we can come up with some question and answer here for the last 10 minutes of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, if there are any questions that you would like to react or ask or react to any uh, of the uh, presentation, uh, if you can uh, 
type your question using the chat uh, feature, and then we will uh, uh, convey that question to, um, uh, to Dr. Riggins. As, as we're waiting for questions, um, one, one question that keeps coming up um, now with the uncertainty in terms of how schools will reopen um, come fall. Um, Mark, do you have any, and, and teachers are, are trying to, even they, they themselves deal with, with uh, you know, whether th they will be returning and, and, and when they return to, to school, what the new format might look like. Um, and that can be causing a great deal of stress uh, for teachers. What what recommendations do you have for teachers who may be struggling with with that decision? Well, so that's that's what's that that third one that I was talking about that that, that schools are in the middle, both the highest risk illness wise and the highest necessity economics wise. Um, they we will, I believe, try to open schools and in. in person way partially in the fall um, because it's very hard to run our economy without this. We will try to do some things with virtually no money and cuts to try to make the health risk less, but they will not make it none. Going to school will be likely the most risky health things that most people do. It'll probably will increase to an another bump in the and the uh, curve and the number of cases coming through. We will probably have to be doing opening, closing and testing things and people coming in and out and you will have some risk um, by, by doing this. Um, but we can't, in the same way that we couldn't afford to keep the businesses closed forever, we can't afford to keep schools closed forever because the economy can't run that way. Um, it does appear on the positive side that children are, have a harder time getting this and have much less chance of getting severe illnesses or dying or needing hospitalization. It's not zero, and there are some weird things that happen to um, kids, but that it's it, at least they are less risk. And so you're also looking at who else are you exposing in your household and people around and when you're trying to make these decisions. But it's not going to be an atmosphere of I'm going to be safe. Actually, let me do one quick digression on this, is that when someone is – when we talk to people who have been rape victims, we tell them, you know, there's nothing you can do to be totally safe. You can always be victimized at some time in the future. But you don't have to be reckless. You can take precautions, but you also want to go on with the things in life that have meaning and are important to you. You can't let the fear win. This is a situation in which it's appropriate to feel some fear going back. It's person to take some precautions, but we do have to go on with uh, life at school as best we can. And these are going to be incredibly difficult decisions. It's going to take all the way down to the last minute for administrations to set up. Don't expect any uh, concrete answers early on. Um, Mark, you, uh, one question. Well, there's actually a lot of questions coming in. Oh, good. Uh, so I'm going to go in order that, they, that we received them. Uh, Mindy asks, how would you suggest personal growth from home? So we're going to actually, I'm going to talk a bunch about things, it didn't, different strategies in the next couple things, but sort of think where, which of these levels is most important for your personal uh, growth? Are you trying to make sure you're secure and there's enough money and food around? Are you trying to make sure that you've got your own identity? Are you doing things that make you feel like yourself? Are you, if you think yourself, I'm the social butterfly flirt artist, like Anne Frank was, Make sure you're on social media being a butterfly uh, flirt artist. Make sure you're drawing things and doing things to build things. If you're someone on the level, you're really trying to do more connectedness and more friends, make sure you're doing a lot of things. It's my belief that the, the uh, social media things is not as good as individual, but to push it as much as you can. Think of what you need to grow at this time rather than putting your life on hold. Just waiting and saying, I'll see what happens and I'll just gonna do nothing and wait this out for a year is a long time for a young person. And you'll you'll deteriorate if you just wait. Thank you. Hi, Mindy. Didn't I now I can see your picture. I didn't see you before. The next question, um, uh, well, David, uh, 
adds that uh, later in life, uh, Maslow added a new um, highest level, which was called uh, transcendence. Transcendent. Transcendence, I'm sorry, transcendence. Care to comment on that or any thoughts? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I like thinking about really, really high levels. And I found myself so distracted by problems I was having on maintaining on the lower levels that this has not been a great time for me to think about transcendence. However, I've managed to get my head above water from time to time to be able to think about this some. And my personal belief is that it is not a coincidence that we're facing a mental health crisis and a climate crisis at the same time. Right. That we have to be mentally better together in order to take care of our planet and that our planet has to be better together in order to take care of us mentally. And that we need to have more transcendence in the sense of being together with our planet and one with the whole thing in order to solve things, because that's gonna be our next great challenge to, to go forward to. We can't use the same kind of materialistic way of getting there. But that's just my personal belief about things. You can find other people who think about transcendence in different ways. Can I add, um some research that was done um, sure. in the last six or seven years on purpose-driven learning, having a transcendent purpose, that um, kids would be more successful in school if not just having, not, you know, it's good to have a purpose, like I want to be a firefighter or whatever, you know, you have some kind of goal in and of itself, but, but the, the real difference in terms of um, kids' success in education and life really breaks breaks through when kids have a common um, um, a goal for the common good okay so to do something good in the world for other people which is then called a transcendent purpose so that so research actually s suggests that educators could actually use that um, more actively in terms of what happens in school or in the classroom so believe it or not, we're going to uh, please show up three weeks from now because we're going to have a whole bunch sort of about that in the how do we bounce, how do we bounce back and grow from this uh, about what are your core gifts? How do you share your gifts with the uh, community? How do you get these sense of higher purpose? What are we doing this for? It isn't just about surviving. How can we move, move on above this? I think I think it's worth, the only point I want to make at this point about that one, David, and thank you very much for adding this stuff, is that I think it's important to meet people where they're at. If they're literally, if, if wherever their development is at, if they're in self-expression and feel crushed, then maybe these bigger purposes in part of things. But if you can get those unstuck, then the higher people move, the more powerful things will be. And people are capable, young people are capable of being at higher levels if they're not so terribly stuck down below. Right. right. Thank you, David. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you, David. Um, we have time for well, maybe a couple of questions, uh, Mark. Next question comes from uh, Roxana. How do you suggest engaging in conversations surrounding anxiety and depression stemming from systemic oppression and inequalities? <laughs> if I knew the answer to that one, I would have, I would have trashed this entire presentation and done that as my presentation today. Um, we sure need the answer to that, Roxana. Um, and it's probably what I'm gonna end up thinking about a lot over time. Part of me, what I did end up with a, with a strange, the only thing I know differently about that now than I didn't know last week is when I saw it in this context, these developmental levels, I wasn't, I was thinking this heavily in terms of things like meaning and identity and connectedness. I wasn't thinking of it in so much in terms of basic sur survival and security. That this, this may be that I grew up with, I, I mean, I'm a middle-class white boy from Woodland Hills. I grew up with a fair bit of security and I don't think much about those levels and I end up, lo and I end up lo um, losing those things and just being oblivious. Um, and I think, paying more attention to, is there really basic security? Are you sure when you call the people who are supposed to give you safe that they're not gonna kill you? Does it need to be dealt with on that level in addition to all these uh, systemic things that we've been um, talking about? Because I think it's easy for us to sometimes to get into the higher things 
without saying, wait a minute, just basic, I could get killed every moment and I'm walking around. Um, I have, the only other thing I wanna say about that actually is that I think this for many, some of the people I've talked to said, you know, now you know how I felt my whole life. You're now you're a little scared to go outside and you're anxious and you stay inside and everybody else could be out to hurt you and you gotta keep your distance from thing and you're kind of hyper vigilant just by going to the store and these sorts of things that this pandemic where anyone could be deadly to you, in some ways is the first real emotional experience I've had to be able to empathize where, where people of color coming from deprived neighborhoods or severe domestic violence or things like this, or systemic racism have been living their whole life. And hopefully that little bit of experience will help me empathetically to connect some. But I think we're a long way from knowing the answers to that, Roxanne. That's why we keep getting in this giant hall. Well, Mark, we're, we're at 2 o'clock. And what I would like to do is to um, uh, look at, the, at the, there are quite a bit of questions that I think are very uh, good questions. And, and perhaps we can address them uh, throughout the, uh, the next uh, uh, three uh, sessions. Uh, we, will, we will do our best to. Uh, our, um, archive these and then share them with uh, Dr. Reagans and uh, try to find or, or have him uh, find time and, and see if he can respond um, to these questions and share those with the rest of the group um, in the next uh, coming session. So, um, Mark, any last words? Well, let me just say that the, on the screen you're looking at the uh, uh, the Calhosta website uh, or, or how to log into the website. And uh, again, these web these webinars are are will be recorded and will be uh, uh, posted on the Calhosa website. Uh, Mark, any, any last minute comments uh, before we end today's session? Just thank you all for spending this time with me. I sure wish we'd been able to do it in person and really meet and con connect with each other. This still feels awfully distant to me, but like everything that's on Zoom, it's better than nothing. I'm glad we were able to spend this time. I hope to see most of you next week if you're able to come. Thank you.